It's no exaggeration to say the original Flying Shark was one of the most important and influential games in shmup history. The number two table arcade of 1987 Japan behind Arkanoid, it influenced nearly every vertical shooter that followed, Toa Plan's best-selling release worldwide. And it's aged like fine wine, being as fun and easy to pick up and play as it was then. In fact, despite some viewing the flashier sequel Fire Shark as the main event, many prefer the first game. The difficulty was well balanced, making it more accessible. The music was outstanding, and the Japanese arcade release was very close to programmer Masahiro Yuge's original vision. What it lacked in newer graphics, variety, and length, it made up for by simply being well executed. In 1987, there wasn't much of anything quite like it. Two years later, Toa Plan upped the ante with the bigger, badder Same Same Same, aka Fire Shark. Double the levels and double the flash. The weapon system got a major overhaul with the now famous flamethrower, synonymous with the game. And the soundtrack was rockin'. Your plane was much faster with speed ups introduced, but so were the bullets. And how. The Japan original was known for being insanely hard, to the point of complaint. So a toned down, two player version was released, making it more enjoyable for most. Believe it or not, Programmer Masahiro Yuge didn't originally want it that difficult. The edict came down from the top to greatly increase the difficulty. I always enjoyed Fire Shark for its greater speed and more manic gameplay versus the more paced, strategic original. Even though it looked like a sequel to the first, it played a lot more like a mix between Q Tiger and Tatsujin with the faster ship, bullet speed, and weapon style of the latter, not to mention being clearly inspired by the blue laser. So while Fire Shark may not be as pure as the original, it is a hell of a lot of fun to play, and I enjoy it quite a bit. Both games are vintage to a plan and have been bundled together along with home ports and extras in M2's new collection. Because I've already reviewed and ranked both of these games in my recent Every Toa Plan Shooter video, I want to focus on the actual collection, the features and extras. How are the home ports and are they worth playing? Along with the extra game Wardner, an early Toa Plan platformer, you'll get an overview of the entire collection to help decide which version is right for you, whether the basic digital package or the added DLC and extra content. My favorite thing about M2 Shot Triggers and why I look forward to them so much is that we don't just get some emulated collection of games slapped into a cartridge or CD. If I just wanted to play the original ROM, I could do it free with emulation. But M2 turns each release into a celebration of the games. They're reverse engineering each PCB and recoding from scratch to not only make the definitive arcade port, but also make the games infinitely more accessible, easy and custom modes for otherwise brutally hard games. Not only gadgets breaking down the games and giving you insight into how they work, but slick improvements like showing you the incoming direction of enemies so you don't get surprised from behind or the sides with incoming waves. Even top tier players like Jamers find details to gush over, like a gadget that reveals the secret of where to be on the screen to trigger these planes to drop one-ups in Sami 3. Who else does that? When we get a Shot Triggers release, it becomes the de facto standard and eliminates the need to ever use a ROM again with a superior experience. That, along with best-in-class emulation, hitting consistently fast three frames of delay on their games, like I again measured here, means it's a package that top players can dig into as well without fear of performance problems. Aside from owning the PCB, this is the definitive way to play, with all the cool features the original board can't provide. When M2 releases a collection, I know it's my final purchase of the game, as it's the last word on how I'll play them going forward. Now the M2 releases are not perfect, with the biggest problem not having a sorely needed English translation. M2, please, we're begging you, with a giant bowl of ice cream covered in flying sharks and with flamethrowers on top. Players 
all over the world love and support your work. Please don't ignore us and provide us an English menu option with shot triggers. We support your hard work and we deserve it. There's also the issue of price. About 30 bucks for the main games and all those features is totally worth it in my opinion. But the full price physical at 70 bucks with the console ports included and extra Toa Plan game is a harder sell as they don't have all the features and gadgets. So unless you really want the extra extra Toa Plan game, in this case Wardner, or don't already have a way to play the console ports, it may or not be worth the extra cost to you. And M2 realizes that, which is why digitally you have the option to choose which DLC to go for, or none at all. The main release provides all three versions of the arcade Hishozami, along with every version of Same 3 as well. It's a bit of a bummer that only the original Japanese versions get the gadget treatment, but given the time and budget constraints, only being able to choose one version of each, it does make sense they chose the definitive original Toa Plan releases and not the modified variants. Just keep in mind if playing the variants, the gadgets aren't an option, and the gadgets are both cool and useful. On the right you can see your location in the stage, when you've reached the checkpoint, and even boss health bars that pop up like for these large tanks. On the left you have the current rank of both the bullet speed and difficulty, along with the next item carrying planes and bonuses. And like all gadgets you can choose which you want or remove the ones you don't to minimize distraction. One of the most popular additions to these new Toll Plan collections has been the super easy modes. It lowers how high the rank can climb and how fast the bullets can be along with enabling auto bomb, allowing you to take multiple hits before death. If you've already played the game, you'll have no problem getting a no death run in this mode, but it shines for the young kiddos, being just hard enough to give them a challenge, but not overwhelming. So if you've got young sons or daughters and want them to try some old school shooting, it's a perfect difficulty level for them to play around with. Though as you can see, even the super easy mode on the brutal Same 3 can get really spicy and eat through your bomb stock in the latter half. With blazing fast bullets, even if there's less of them. A good way to learn enemy patterns and what to expect. Having the caution light up to show you where a dangerous wave of enemies is coming from is really helpful when learning the game, as killing them quickly before they can fire their ultra fast sniper bullets is the only way to get very far. But the custom mode is where many will dig into the game, as you can fine tune the settings to a reasonable difficulty level as you play and improve. You can change the usual things like overall difficulty, lives, power level and speed, and much more. You can also adjust your auto fire rate to your preference across a few settings. And they were savvy enough to add an option for the flame weapon in Same 3 to automatically disable auto fire for it when used and make sure it functions properly. But what I found surprising is the few missing options that were there in the Tiger Heli collection that were quite useful. The problem with the Arcade Same 3 is how insane the bullet speeds become, and I was looking forward to an option that adjusted the scaling of the bullet speed and rank, but you only get the base overall difficulty option here. A way to set the max rank similar to Q-Tiger, and bullet speed max would have been nice too. So you could set it to something reasonable and not let it cross into ridiculous territory at least not until you're ready to step it up. You also can't adjust your hitbox size, making it smaller, which is something the Q-Tiger collection also had. You of course have the options of playing the more approachable two-player version also included, and will still have access to save states and most options, but you'll lose the gadgets included in the arcade mode. Just like M2's previous collections, you also get an arcade challenge mode, where you can practice any stage section by section. Choose your power level and settings and see which sections you can clear with or without rewinds. And of course, the online leaderboards are here, including the ability to view replays from players around the world. Extremely valuable when trying to figure out the best tricks for difficult sections by viewing gameplay from top scorers, all easily accessed from the menu. M2 realizes the importance of scoring and competition for the longevity of these games, and their suite of online options, replays, and rankings never disappoints. As expected, you can rotate the screen, adjust the width and height, 
scan lines, interpolation, and various display properties to fine tune the image. The media library gives you access to assets for the game, which is extensive for the supported arcade modes, but unfortunately lacking in any of the ports. I went to see a sound test menu for the NES version of Sky Shark to play back some of Tim Fallon's custom tracks, and even to Wardner Arcade, the Toll Plan Extra for this collection, but sadly they were grayed out. So as much as I dig all the extra ports and DLC which I'll show soon, especially Wardner Arcade, they're not the same painstakingly complete and definitive versions that you get with the mainline games. The most important part, the games themselves, are emulated as well as anywhere with typical M2 quality, but the extra features are absent. But despite the fact that the options are just slightly more sparse than the previous collection overall, this is still without a doubt the definitive way to play these two games. And I somehow doubt that a better one will come along. It's because M2 releases are so complete that when corners are cut for time and budget, it stands out because we look for it. But compared to most other collection releases we see that don't perform nearly on this level, nor have even close to the amount of options and detail. Shot Triggers are clearly still the team to beat in that respect. So if you do love the Shark series by Toll Plan, I'll say it again, this is a no-brainer purchase for the mainline games at around 30 bucks. But are you also a lover of the console ports? Did you happen to grow up like I did playing Sky Shark on the NES and then Fire Shark on the Mega Drive? If so, and you're looking for a convenient way to replay old favorites as part of the same collection, then you have the option to grab them as DLC or with the complete physical version they come included. Yes, I did grow up playing Sky Shark on NES, now known for the rock and music remixes done by Tim Fallon. But as a kid, all I knew is it was a fast paced, much faster than the methodical arcade game. Super unfair, yet somehow addicting shooter. The graphics were simple, even by NES standards. Almost lazy in ways, like the ocean just being a solid color. But nostalgia is a hell of a drug, and I still have some fond memories of playing it. But how did it fare coming back to it so many years later? I gotta admit, this one is mainly for those who want to relive their youth, as anyone coming in fresh may quickly be turned off by the warts and the jank. Now, it's still as fun to play as ever, which is why we enjoyed it, but the programming is whack. Your hitbox seems like the entire plane, and often you'll die when you're clearly between a set of bullets. You just can't trust the hit detection, so you'll end up memorizing how to circumvent patterns completely to avoid cheap deaths. Many of the backgrounds obscure the bullets, often disappearing or being hard to see. Add in plenty of flicker and cheap deaths go up. It can totally be figured out, as we did back then. And for those of us who liked it, it's a fun nostalgia trip. But for anyone new, uh, don't get your hopes up. Expect a fun to play game, but that'll kill you cheaply and often. But at least you can try to enjoy the Tim Fallen remixes along the way. In a way, pretty typical Nintendo back then. One port that's absolutely worth getting excited over is Fire Shark on the Mega Drive. Always an excellent port and fun to play back in the day, and how most of us first discovered it. Going back now, it holds up great, and is even an ideal way for entry level players to first experience the game. The default difficulty was always set to easy, and while it seems overly so at first, the latter half of the game will get plenty spicy for the casual player. For the more experienced, set it to normal and go. Not nearly as hard as the arcade, yet still satisfying to play. The flamethrower is extra powerful here and my ideal weapon of choice to the end. Unlike the spread being needed for the arcade, most importantly, this port captures the thrill of using the flamethrower at full power and the satisfying sound of the devastation it leaves in its wake.
All of the music sounds fantastic and is converted extremely well, giving the game an authentic feel despite lacking in the graphics department compared to the arcade. This was another game ported by Toa Plan themselves and graphic artist Shintaro Nakaoka, who did many of their Mega Drive ports at the time, including Truxton and Zero Wing, also did a fine job here converting the more advanced arcade graphics to the much more limited 16 on-screen color palette of the Mega Drive. Just like in the arcade original, you still have to play dodge the power-ups way more often than I'd like, but aside from some expected and minor slowdown, this is a classic that should be played by any fan of Mega Drive shooters. And finally, the extra Toa Plan game that honestly surprised me with how much time I ended up putting into it, Wardner no Mori. I'd never played through it completely until this collection. And I have to admit that despite my initial lukewarm impression from some research and footage, it turned out to be a surprisingly nuanced and complete platformer. This was back in 1987, so the graphics and sound are simpler. But what's needed to traverse the stages is far more involved than your typical arcade platformer, in that it requires significant exploration, memorization, and trial and error before you figure out how to properly navigate each level. It has lots of hidden secrets, and things you'll only find and learn after having completed it multiple times. A maze-like stage that has to be navigated a very specific way in order grabbing time extensions to avoid running out, and weapon upgrades after each stage to choose wisely. As being underpowered late game is a no-go. It's more of a thinker's platformer than an action platformer, with the enemies being much easier than the puzzles and stages themselves. Some areas are traps or dead ends, places you don't need to go and placed there to bait you or set you up but you keep exploring because you're often surrounded by something nearby that looks like an area or item that you need to get, just out of reach. The opposite of something like Ghosts and Goblins, which is very fun in terms of action and enemies, but also very linear and punishing in terms of mechanics. Here, it's all about the stages themselves and the enemies are minor obstacles. Each is like figuring out a handful of puzzles within a set time to progress. In that sense, once you do figure it out and memorize them, you'll be able to run through the game without much trouble. Even the final boss, which seems completely cheesy and unfair at first, has a trick where you can kill him easily without danger. So if you're looking for a very fair platformer that needs to be figured out, as opposed to having to get good, skill-wise, to complete, Wardner is a good choice. It rewards memorization and knowing the game over platforming skill, and has some fun, catchy tunes along the way. Unfortunately, the Mega Drive port of Wardner isn't included, most likely for licensing reasons. But the rare Famicom Disk System port is, and despite being a step down graphically and orally, is generally quite faithful in terms of gameplay. It adds some unique elements, like a health bar, and a bomb item that you can use when switching through the pause menu. Wardner has a lot more content to enjoy versus Get Star on the previous collection, so if it's your kind of game, it may make the physical or extra DLC pack worth purchasing. Being someone that loves platformers myself, just about as much as shmups, I was pleasantly surprised and had a good time with Wardner. So what did you think of this latest collection? Is it a series that you're picking up? Or are you waiting for something else like the Tatsujin collection? Let me know in the comments. If you are looking to buy the full physical release, it's for sale on Play Asia, and I've included links in my description. And if you've seriously still not seen my every Toa Plan shooter ranked and reviewed video, you seriously should check it out as it came out really good. And you can do that right here.